Influence. Yes. Influence is a word we hear a lot about today. That's always been around for a long, long time. Simply put, the word influence means this. The power or capacity of causing an effect in indirect or intangible ways. <laughs> That's what the influence is. There's a lot of influences in our world today. You have godly influences. You have ungodly influences. But you also have some of the most powerful influencers of today. That besides the Holy Spirit, of course. <laughs> besides Him. These are actually found on social media. And just the other day, they actually had, a, had one who said, hey, I'm going to give away some things. And so over a thousand teens and so forth basically showed up and kids and youth. And, uh, and they, they, they had had some problems with police and so forth. And they were actually going to charge the guy with potential um, uh, instilling a riot and so forth and so on. That just happened on Friday down in New York City. Well, some of the most powerful influences are found on social media. Yeah, they're called influencers because they do influence people. And part of it is, is that their engagement, they, they, they have a, an audience that is usually in the millions of people. Their ability to connect with people who are willing to listen and believe what they have to say and what they support and what they think and what they're going to do. And so people just, whoa, they just flock to them. And they follow and listen. They're, they're considered to be influencers. Our government even has hired some to be influencers, particularly during the, the COVID time period. The top side for this and actually being an influencer and, and monetizing it, in other words, making money off of it, is, believe it or not, is Instagram. And it's funny, it's a, a lot of them who are on Instagram who are the top influencers or considered the top influencers in social media, not the ones with the most fans, the ones who are the top influencers this way, started on TikTok. That's what, that's what I was discovering this week. It's kind of interesting. But the top influencers, they can make millions of dollars every year just because of making the videos and, influ and, and basically influencing the way you think, influencing in your choices and all of that. And that, this is what the idea of an influencer is, to influence you to think a certain way and to act and make decisions a certain way or purchase a certain product. Again, it's about your thinking. But you know, you don't have to be on social media to be an influencer though. We think today, oh yeah, I, got, well, I, I wanna get on social media because I can, get, I can make an impact and so forth. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But you know, you could be an influencer without being on social media. For example, there was his grandmother. She didn't realize how much of an influence she was upon her family. She was a nurse. She'd been a nurse for quite a few years, obviously, and she writes this. Quote, I didn't realize how much my nursing career had affected my family until the day my three-year-old granddaughter said to me, Grandma, I think my blood sugar is low. Can I have a cookie? <laughs> yeah, my blood sugar is low. Can I have a cookie? Can I have a bag of chips? Can I have, you know, can I, yeah, it, it's interesting. Can I have a big snack or whatnot? You know, pretty smart kid when you think about it. Ingenious idea, a very, very intriguing idea. I'm not so sure if it works with us as adults, but maybe we can try and say, hey, hey, you know, they say to your wife, hey, okay, yeah, my blood sugar's low, I need a cookie. You know? And they say, why are you taking that cookie? My blood sugar's low. You know, I mean, all these different, you know, hey, you're going to use that as an excuse. I know some of us actually have that issue, so probably you shouldn't use that as an excuse. But obviously, her, be, her grandmother being a, a nurse had definitely impacted the child. Even at three years old, she understood this idea kind of to an extent about somehow low blood sugar and maybe you can have a cookie for it and you know, to help with it. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to be influencers. Among the, the, the young, the three-year-olds and younger, and those who are older than us and who are perhaps in their last years of their life, the twilight of their life, and so to speak, and, they, and, they're, and they're perhaps struggling in a home or something. We are to be influencers of everyone that's around us. And we do this by recognizing and also developing by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, he, he's the one who helps develop this. We, we let him develop this. We want him to develop this in us. The traits of being a disciple. Sometimes we don't realize, well, what, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does that look like? What, are, what should I be seeing and doing? And, and that's why we read God's Word and we study it and we've been doing so. 
Now, not all of the traits are given by the elder John as he identifies himself, but some of them are. We have already identified some of them in preceding weeks. In 2 John, we looked at that very short letter. The same thing with 3 John, again, a very short letter. In 2 John, if you recall, again, you can even go back online and get the recording and if you want to listen to that message as well. There were three basic traits that you could find. And the first one is that you walk with Jesus. When you walk with Jesus, you walk in truth and love. Okay, when you walk in truth and love, you're walking with Jesus. They're, 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 they're exactly the same, because Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, and so the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So therefore, He is always with us, and we know that nothing separates us from His love, because He is love. And, and so God's with us, His love is with us, His truth is always with us. So when we walk with Jesus, we're walking in truth, and we're walking in love. But we also know that when we do so, we have grace, mercy, and peace from God. The Bible does not say we will get it from the world, because a lot of times we will not get it from the world. We should not expect to get it from non-believers, from unbelievers, from the world philosophy, the world which is led by the prince of this world, who is Satan. He is a prince. He is not king. Jesus is king. And the prince will have to bow down before him, and he will. And then he will be cast into the lake of fire as well. He will confess that he is Lord. Right now, he doesn't want to, and so he's throwing us as who he is. So we, don't, we do not expect to get grace, mercy, and peace from the world. We should not expect to get grace, mercy, and peace from the world, but we do get it from God. We have it. And we should be extending that as the church to people outside of that. So the world may not extend it, but the church should be extending that to each other and to others outside of it as well. To show that we truly do belong to Christ. We also have a third aspect here from 2 John, is that we confess that Jesus came in the flesh. That is, He is fully human and fully God. But He did come in the flesh. From 3 John, we learned some other traits, too, and that is that we practice hospitality. Yes, among one another as believers, but also extending that beyond as well. Extending what? Grace. Because, well... <laughs> I don't like my neighbor. Well, you know what? Do it anyway. Extend them grace because they, they're just, they make all this noise. You know, we'll extend grace to them as well. Be merciful and uh, extend peace as well. But practice hospitality. Also, we should imitate what is good and not what is evil. Just because someone gets away with something doesn't make it right. But that's not fair. They got away with it. It doesn't matter. What does God say? God said that was wrong. So what if society lets them get away with it? We are to be obedient to our Lord. So we obey Him. So 1 John, today we're going to look at here, I know we kind of did it a little bit backwards and so forth, but I felt like it was a better flow. We're going to do 1 John, and we're going to look at three different aspects in the first chapter, three different traits we're going to see here. One is that we are to give out the message of Jesus. We are to live out the message of Jesus, number two. And then number three is to confess our sin to God because He will forgive. So let's give, live, and be forgiven. So let's go ahead and let's read 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. If you turn in your Bibles, that would be really good for you to follow along here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared... We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Okay, if you read that fast, it's kind of like, what is he talking about? We have seen and heard and all this. Like, what, 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 what? What's he... Okay, it's actually fairly simple. He's talking about that, which was from the beginning. You know, we're talking about the beginning of the beginning. I mean, it's just before time. Way, we're talking eternal beginning. And the beginning was God. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1 1, 1 says, the, in the beginning was the Word. The same type of thinking, the same thing here. From the beginning, eternal beginning. He says, we have heard... We have looked at. We have touched. He's talking about the, the word of life. Who's the word of life? What's this word of life? The Greek word as translated here is logos. 
And what that means is revelation. That's what it means. It means revelation. Simply put, it's a revelation. And, and, it's, and Jesus is God's, is revealing God to us, if you will. He is the revelation of God to us. He is the Word. So John here is talking about Jesus, as he does in the prologue of his gospel. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He's talking about Jesus here. He's the Word of life. He is the eternal life. He is life. He's talking about Jesus. He is the Word, and He is the revelation of God to us. He, and all, God and all His fullness dwelt in Him. So that when we looked upon Jesus, we saw the Father, as He says in the Gospel of John. So Jesus was from the beginning, because He is God. He has eternal beginning. He was, He is, and He always will be. John heard him teach. He saw him as he walked the earth as his apostle, disciple slash apostle. I'm sure he probably hugged him. He ate with him. He probably shook his hand, probably had Jesus' arm went over, wrapped around him at times, you know, and so forth, or slapped him on the back, say, hey, nice job, whatever it is. I mean, who knows? I mean, it, you know, it's a pretty cool stuff here he was able to do. Because Jesus came in the flesh. That's the whole point. He came in the flesh. He is fully human. He is a man. Jesus was from the beginning because He is God, God the Son. And he, here he is, he is man. He is the Son of Man. He's also called the Son of God. He's fully man and fully God. And John will tell others, because he wants us to have fellowship together, and not only with us as a body of believers to increase that fellowship and add to the numbers, but also that we have fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, being united as one. That's where your joy is complete when we're all together and so forth. And he's talking about the joy is that you would join us. And you, and you do join us. We are joined together as one. John will tell others about it, that Jesus is the life, and Him is eternal life. You're not going to get eternal life apart from Him. There is no other name under heaven in which we can be saved. It's only through Jesus. And when we find Him, we trust in Him as our Lord and Savior. And when you do that, you will have, you shall have. That's a, more, that's a power, more powerful word. You shall have eternal life. And you shall be given, forgiven of your sin. That's what he's pointing to. That's what he's saying. This is the trait of a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's another trait of that. And that is that we give out the message of Jesus Christ to others. We don't keep it among ourselves. We share that message. People may question us. They may accept it. They may embrace it. They may reject it. They may mock it. But regardless, we give it out. When you plant grass seed, not every seed comes up. Some places come up great. Others kind of die off or never come up. But what do you do? You keep working that soil to try to get grass to grow in there. Or you just let weeds grow, I guess. But we try to get something to grow. We don't give up. We scatter the seed everywhere. And where it goes, it goes. But our, one of the traits of a disciple is we give out the message of Jesus Christ. We don't keep it to ourselves. The letter continues. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. So he's saying here the message is that God is light. There's no darkness in him whatsoever. He is light. He's not eh, half on, half off. No, he is high beam, full light. That's it. There, there is nothing else. Blinding light. He is light. There is no darkness, meaning no deceit in him. There's no trickery. There's no evil. There's no sin. There's nothing in that. What do you find in God? You find truth. You find goodness. You find righteousness. You find holiness, majesty. You find purity. <laughs> I mean, you can keep on going, but He is light. And as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to walk in the light. Because His light guides us so we can see where we are going. So we walk in truth. 
We walk in goodness. We walk in righteousness. We walk in holiness. We walk in His majesty and His splendor. We walk in Him and His strength. We walk in freedom because we are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. And we live out every day, we are to live out the reality of being saved. The reality of walking in the light through Jesus every day. That's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to live out this reality. That's another trait of being a disciple is that we live out the message of Jesus. We don't just give it. We live it. We do what we are proclaiming. So that way people can hear and see the message of Jesus Christ and hopefully become convinced so that they too will be saved by believing in Him. Now, as you know, this is a, a season where you begin to really, hopefully, if you plant a garden, you begin to harvest a lot of stuff. I mean, it started beforehand a little bit, but it, this is the time when it really starts coming in. Your tomatoes are in. I mean, the string beans, you know, we're getting a second crop of those coming on here soon. You're getting your cucumbers. You're probably perhaps getting something. Maybe you're going to start getting some cantaloupe and maybe a watermelon if you're doing those things. You know, your peppers start coming on. I mean, this is where you really start getting, you know, you got your squash and everything. If things really start coming in in August, and, and this is the time of year when you get that. Now, not everybody grows a garden, but, you know, growing a garden is, is very good. It, it's a good thing to have. There's so many positives to it. You can have fresh produce. Having that fresh produce, it's organic. I mean, it's not sprayed with all kinds of junk and everything like this. It's organic. It's healthy for you in many ways because it's good food. It's organic. It tastes great. It's good for your financial um, health because it's cheaper. It tastes really good. It gives you exercise. You've got to get out there and weed and stuff. I don't like weeding. Well, you know what? But it gives you good exercise. It helps keep you in shape a little bit. And when you're outside working, guess what you get? You get vitamin D, which is in phenomenal for your body and your immune system. You build it, build it up so you have an excess immune system when you enter into the fall season. And if you go around telling people about the benefits of, of having a garden, yet... Don't have one yourself. If say I did that, I went over and say, You need to have a garden, you need to have a garden, garden. I convince you to do it. Do this, do this, do this. And I say, Well, how much time do you commit into your garden? Well, I don't I well, I don't really have time to have a garden. Well, what do you mean? Well, because I'm going around trying to convince people to have one. I don't have time to have one myself. Is my message about having a garden gonna go anywhere? No, it's gonna fall on deaf ears because people are like <laughs> you're telling us that these are the benefits of it and you don't have one? What are you selling us? If we share the message of being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, yet don't live it out, the message that we share will fall on deaf ears. It's like, well, I hear what you're saying, but I don't get it. You're just, you, <laughs> you're just like me. I'm unsaved, and, and, and you're just like me. You say the same things. You do the same things. So well, what's the big deal? I, I hear what you're saying, but yet it doesn't make any difference in your life. We need to give and live the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. We need to live that out every single day, that I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. He is my big brother, if you will. But you know, it's like, yeah, but we screw up sometimes. We do, don't we? What happens when I sin? I guess I'm being a hypocrite, right? You can still walk in the light and say, yeah, but I sin, so I can't be walking in the light. I must be walking in the darkness. Now, listen. What happens when I sin? An impulse can happen. Something, you just react. Boom, it just comes. Out come the harsh words. The thoughts and the desires come. The, the behavior, the reaction comes to it. And you're just like, why did I do that? The Spirit works on you. You're like, oh, I know I shouldn't have said that. Mm, it's not the best thing to say. Why did I say that? You know, what happens? Because I'm walking in the light. I realize I'm convicted that it wasn't the right thing to say. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have reacted that way. I feel remorse. I feel shame Why? because I'm aware of it. What do I do then? I'm telling people I'm walking in the light. I'm telling people and so forth. What do I do? 
Or maybe I wasn't even totally, I was like, yeah, okay, but I'm kind of ignoring it, saying I shouldn't have done that, but you're trying to pretend not. And someone says, hey, why did you say that? And you're like, hey, you, I, I was wrong, I'm sorry. What do we do? You know, I mean, I don't want to sin, but, but I know I do, so what do I do with that? When I, when I discover it, when I'm aware of it, what do I do? I confess it, right? I repent of it, and, and what? Seek forgiveness, right? Okay, here we go, First John chapter 8, chapter 1, excuse, verse 8, excuse me. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word is not in us. So when we confess our sin, our Heavenly Father will forgive that sin. He will forgive that. Did you, did you get that? If we confess our sins, what's He going to do? He's going to forgive us. In fact, He's not going to just forgive us. He's going to what? cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All. You get that word? All. The sin I know of, I confess. Yes, I've lied, I've cheated, I've, I, you know, I had these, these, these impure thoughts and all these things. Yeah, I, I've done those, you know, in my actions, in my selfishness, in my greed, and so forth. I can confess that. But guess what? And say, well, God's going to forgive those. Yes. But there are sin that I commit that I don't even know I did. The Day of Atonement, why was that sin done? They confessed that they are sinners. Could they confess that there's a nation of every single little sin that they did? <laughs> no, they can't remember everything. It was also to cover the sin that they were not aware of. So they could be cleansed of all that unrighteousness. But they had to do that every single year. We have it in Jesus, the Lamb of God, once for all. Am I aware of all of my sin, of everything that I've ever committed? No. Are you? I don't think so. None of us are. See, when we are repentant before God, He will forgive us. We comment it because what we're saying is, is that, God, we are wrong, and you are right. Please forgive me. Yes, we, we confess the sin that we have done. We confess that, that whatever that act, the, that words, that action, the behavior, the attitude, the, whatever it was, we confess that. But you know what? God And God will forgive that. But when we go to Him, Lord, I'm so sorry because I know that I am wrong. Please forgive me. I am a sinner. And if we confess that we are sinners, that He is right and we are wrong, God doesn't just forgive that sin. He also does what? He cleanses us of all sin. He, he, he cleanses us. It's all forgiven in Jesus Christ. But if I say that I have no sin, or that I have not sinned, especially when I compare myself to a prisoner on death row, because I use that comparology. Okay, man, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't, uh, you know, bowed down before any idols. I, I honor my, hey, hey, man, I respect my parents. I obey them, and I've never stolen anything, and, and, I, and I do that, and so forth, and, and I put all the same. So, I, so we look at that person. He's on death row. He murdered people. You know, he, he stole from them. He killed that. I'm nothing like that. And so we think that, hey, I mean, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a generally a good person. He says here simply, I am a liar, and I'm trying to make God out to be a liar, and God's word or truth is not in me. I cannot stand before anyone and say, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a liar, and I'm also trying to say God is a liar. God's word is not in me if I say that. We are all sinners, and therefore we sin. We don't sin and then become a sinner. We are sinners, and then we sin because we're sinners. You know, we start off, we are a sinner. And as the disciples of Jesus, I am to be humble and freely confess that I am a sinner who is redeemed and who is forgiven through the blood of Christ. Yes, I need to be forgiven. <clears throat> and I will not get everything right all the time. I am learning to get things more right, that is more righteous, more holy, more like God, more like Christ would do. Yes, I'm learning. That's why I'm a disciple, because I'm learning 
I need to be forgiven too. I know that God is gracious and merciful because I walk in truth and I walk in love, which means I walk with Jesus. I know He is, and because of that, I know He will not condemn me because, man, I can't believe you messed up one more time again. That's it. I'm done with you. No, He doesn't do that. Instead, He picks me back up again, cleanses me, forgives me. He said, Listen, okay, let's start again. You know, let, let's continue. Let's keep going. I know that God will forgive and cleanse me of all unrighteousness because He is faithful. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have, there's lots of different characteristics that, that God, the Holy Spirit, is trying to mold into us and to shape into us. And one of those, and then we just learned about three of them here today. And they're very simple to actually remember. We are to give out the message of Jesus to others. We are to live out the message for others to see the truth that we are proclaiming. And we are to confess our sin, knowing that God the Father will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive us. So we give live and be forgiven. Those are traits of us as disciples that, that we need to encourage in one another and, we, and the world needs to see so that they too can come to understand the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And they too then become a disciple. And we can walk together as we learn to live for Him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I do pray today that You would just help each one of us, help me to learn to be your disciple and to allow God the Holy Spirit, to allow you to, to mold and shape me so that I am able to give out the message of Jesus in more boldly and more courage, more consistency. I'm able to faithfully live out the message and when I fall short, knowing that I confess my sin and, and you will forgive me. Lord, we want others to understand this truth. We are not perfect beings. We know that, Lord. We know that we are sinners and we simply are fallen short. But yet, we also understand who you are and that we are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. And you have died, you sent your son to die once for all. And we know your desire is that all would be saved and come to repentance, that no one would perish. And so, Lord, help us. Please help us to be your faithful disciples. And that we would grow step by step as our faith increases and our lives become more conformed to the image of your Son, Father, the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. God bless.